Hi everyone, Sue again, and here for the second in our series of um, lectures about uh, related to uh, urinary system and uh, uropathologies. And in um, this section, I'm going to be talking in particular about obstructive uro uropathies. And so that's the kinds of conditions that lead to some kind of obstruction within and related to the urinary system. So we'll talk about that just a little bit in general terms. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, urinary tract calculi. Most of you have heard of those in uh, lots of, um, uh, you know, outside of nursing situations where people refer to having kidney stones. Uh, you may have looked after patients with that. They're not always within the kidney. They may be or within the urinary uh, system. Uh, we'll talk about urinary tract tumors, uh, urinary incontinence and retention. Although there's lots of um, causes for urinary incontinence and retention, uh, it relates in particular to this obstructive process. And so we'll talk about it here recognizing that, again, there are many processes. Um, and we'll look in within that at nursing management and instrumentation. So instrumentation is uh, the kinds of things that we are involved in, the um, uh, interventions that we would be involved in, in particular, the insertion of catheters and other things. Uh, we'll talk about BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Uh, again, very common. Many of you will have had patients already or will by the end of your nursing program care for patients with BPH. We'll look at some interventions, in particular TERP, transurethral resection of the prostate, or suprapubic prostatectomy, both uh, relevant procedures to talk about and to understand. Uh, TERP in particular, although both of them, but TERP in particular is often good fodder for the NCLEX. We're also gonna talk about urinary diversion, the kinds of uh, methods that we may use uh, for urinary diversion and how as um, we are experts in the care of patients who require this, what we would be observing for um, in a situation like that. So on we go. Look at this beautiful diagram. The uh, renal system is beautiful. Uh, and again, remember from when you looked at the uh, diagram for UTI, how we have that beautiful kidney up there with the pelvis um, and how important it is to recognize the function of the kidney and the various components. When we move out of the kidney, we've got ureters on both sides that lead down towards um, our bladder. And within our bladder, again, we can have uh, lots of processes that, that lead in particular to an infective um, experience. Uh, we talked about interstitial cystitis in the last lecture. Uh, but also in this lecture, we're gonna talk about um, the kinds of things that can lead to an obstruction, either within our bladder uh, affecting urine flow into the bladder or affecting urine flow out from the bladder. So if we look below the uh, level of the bladder, we see that we've got the prostate there for men. Um, for women, we can have uh, strictures beneath it. For both men and women, we can see that cal um, calculi or those kidney stones can form anywhere right from the kidney all the way down through the ureters into the bladder and uh, right down into uh, the urethra, although the urethra for women in particular is very short, it's very unlikely that if you had your kidney stone moving there, it would stay likely, it would pass all the way through if you've moved it all that way down. Um, uh, we also are look, going to be talking about uh, things like tumors that can impact um, the ability of the body to pass urine through a particular area because of the pressure that that growing tumor can place. And that can again range all the way from the very top in your kidney through down to pressure on your ureters, pressure on your bladder, pressure uh, beneath your bladder uh, at your urethra. Um, we can have strictures through any of these uh, small narrow passageways, so through our ureters and through our urethra. We can actually notice uh, often that narrowing of that uh, utero vesicle junction, so right between the ureter and uh, moving into your bladder. There can be a real narrowing there that can lead to difficulty in emptying. Um, and then uh, when we're thinking about moving to examine our bladder, not only can we experience problems again with tumors and with calculi or those stones, but neurogenic issues. So often that's referred to in a category called functional issues and neurogenic um, issues can lead to challenges with emptying your bladder so that you can actually have a bladder that becomes overfilled and um, have real difficulty emptying it. So important just as an overview to remember that urinary obstruction is um, a term that's really referring to an anatomical or functional conditions and that those conditions they block or they impede the uh, flow of urine. So we can have those conditions because we we're born with them, so they're congenital, or we can acquire them. Uh, for example, we talk about neurogenic bladder issues, 
that may, um, one of the most common causes of that is um, uh, paralysis related to, for example, a motor vehicle accident or some other traumatic spinal cord injury that leads to uh, an inability to have that uh, functional relay system through our bladder. Um, so again, I'm just gonna talk about this. We see the, the terms on the diagram. We can have intrinsic causes of the uh, obstructions. So for example, uh, those tumors, uh, diverticuli, which are uh, like little outpouchings that can cause a problem, or even benign growth, so not a cancerous tumor, but a benign growth within your urinary tract. We can have extrinsic tumor uh, issues, so that's extrinsic to the urinary system. So you're not having the tumor within your urinary system, but it's creating pressure that pushes against the urinary system. So again, you could have tumors, you could have uh, fibrosis, you could have a prolapse of those adjacent organs. And in particular, um, for women, we see prolapse of the uterus is often a problem. And you can even have prolapsing of your bowel uh, that, pressure, that presses onto your, your bladder and beyond. And, and finally, that, that term that we talked about, functional, right? And you'll see that on the left of your screen at the bottom where it's a neurological or sometimes psychogenic factors that affect that. So um, let's start with uh, urinary tract calculi or what we often call uh, kidney stones. One out of 10 Canadians will have a kidney stone at some point in their life, so it's pretty common. And again, that's important to recognize that for all of us as nurses, we're likely to look after patients who experience this, but also that becomes good fodder for testing. Uh, many of these people require hospitalization because of the extreme um, uh, discomfort associated with a kidney stone. It's funny that something that is so tiny can be small as a, a grain of sand can be so incredibly painful, absolutely incredibly devastatingly painful. Um, so it's interesting also to uh, keep in mind that in Canada, the incidence of, of kidney stones is highest in the east. So Eastern provinces and decreases as we move to the West. And I'm not sure that we have any understanding of why, um, but, but there is for sure a geographic component. Um, stones associated with, uh, except for stones that are associated particularly with UTIs, <coughs> excuse me for that, uh, uh, having kidney stones is more common in men than women. So except for the ones that are specific to, uh, specifically formed because of recurrent UTI, um, it's more often than not men uh, develop kidney stones more than women. Majority of patients with stones are um, uh, middle, uh, in um, midlife, so 20 to 55 years of age. And it's important to recognize that, that this runs in families. Recurrence of stones can be as much as 50%. So if you have a kidney stone, you have a 50% likelihood of having a recurrence, which is really pretty crummy because one time is enough, more than enough for most people. Uh, and it's funny that there is a seasonal variation. We said there's a geographic variation with a greater incidence in the eastern provinces. There's also a seasonal variation uh, where stones occur more often in the summer months. And that sort of suggests that dehydration may be part of this process, that as we become dehydrated, that may impact stone formation. Um, it seems also to show an increase in incidence in um, as countries become more industrialized. And again, not necessarily having clear understanding yet, but that's an emerging uh, observation that's important for us to recognize. So lots of factors are involved in the incidence and the type of stones that form. And there's things like uh, metabolic um, uh, processes, in particular, the amount of calcium that is circulating in your system. You can have a high level of calcium. For example, if you have a tumor not related to your kidneys, uh, but you have a high level of circulating calcium, it's uh, likely to lead to the form more, more, more likely to lead to the formation of a kidney stone. Uh, dietary influences, so for example, uh, if you take a lot of calcium in, if you uh, drink a lot of fruit juice and other things, you are much more likely to have that uh, occur. In a climate that's hot and you're sweating a lot, you're much more likely to have uh, that occur again, uh, suggesting that dehydration may be part of it. Immobility seems to be a factor that predisposes you, and there seems to be some conception that um, occupational influences are relevant as well. So lots of theories about um, this, the formation and why this happens, but there's no single theory that can account for all of the types of kidney stones. So we're really um, a little bit at a loss to understand the entire pathology. <clears throat> 
One thing we do know is that when we have uh, crystals in super saturated uh, concentration in the urine, they can precipitate out. And as they precipitate out of that uh, super concentrated state in the urine, they form a, a stone. And again, you often think these stones are really like ginormous. They're not, they're, they're often quite tiny. So important to recognize that the more we keep urine dilute and free flowing, the more likely we are to reduce the incidence of kidney stones. Important again to recognize that we can look at a variety of diagnostic interventions, um, including again, urinalysis. We're gonna look for the, um, the presence of uh, blood in the urine. Uh, we can do a urine culture. We can do an uh, intravenous pilogram. That's going to give us, uh, we're going to be able to inject dye and look at the uh, progression of that dye through the urinary system and see if there's any blockages. Uh, we can look at, do an ultrasound as well and a cystoscopy. Uh, when we do a plain film of the abdomen, so just a, an x-ray uh, or even a, a basic ultrasound, renal ultrasound, we can identify a stone only if it's a larger stone. Uh, it, but it can be helpful as a very beginning uh, diagnostic intervention. Critical when we're looking at um, a treatment is that we look at pain control. I, just a personal story, I was in the ER, um, gosh, I don't even remember what I was there for, uh, about a year ago, I think I was with, oh, my, I was with my mom. So I was with my mom and my sister and I were in the waiting room and a man came in and he was so profoundly distressed, uh, um, he, so profoundly distressed, sweating, couldn't sit down, pacing. It was very clear, profoundly distressed. And you could tell from a mile away that this man had a kidney stone. You could see he was moving his hand sort of towards his, his genital area, not doing something um, inappropriate. I am absolutely confident that, that that's where he was experiencing the pain and it was unbearable. And fine, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, somebody come out and just take him right back. Kidney stones you take immediately back for treatment because the pain is extraordinary. Uh, and finally, they did take him back. And as the nurse approached him, she said, oh, I see you're back. You were here this morning. So clearly, they had not um, uh, managed to relieve the underlying cause of his uh, pain in, when he had been there earlier. Uh, typically, we would really focus on um, pain control, and uh, although we try to, as much as possible, avoid opioids, this is a situation where we actually would use opioids um, because the pain is so severe. We want patients to be able to strain their urine. Um, often that kidney, so we want to relieve the pain, but it's just time uh, sometimes that, need, that is most helpful in enabling us to determine if the person has passed that stone on their own, so we want them to strain their urine and see if they can catch that and we'll send patients home with a strain, uh, strainer if um, their uh, pain is managed in such a way that they would see, it would seem appropriate to send them home. We can do lithotripsy, which we, where we actually break up that stone with um, some like radio waves. Um, and we really would focus that idea of uh, pushing fluids, remaining active, remember uh, immobility was one of the other uh, predisposing factors and watching what they take in their diet. When we're talking about pushing fluids, a really good sort of benchmark would be three liters of fluid a day. So let's talk a little bit more about um, sort of the collaborative care the, and the interventions that we would be involved with. Uh, remember, we're watching for uh, symptoms associated with pain, infection, and obstruction. Okay, pain, infection, obstruction. And Often we're, be, uh, we're uh, beginning management of the pain with opioids. Now remember, typically we talk about using all kinds of alternatives before we get to opioids. Uh, when we know, in particular, if we've got diagnosis that's very clear that we have a urinary calculi, it's so important to treat that pain appropriately. So we're gonna give uh, opioids at frequent intervals uh, to relieve what we refer to as that renal colic. Uh, so that colicky pain is the spasming of the, um, that smooth muscle, whether it's in the um, ureter or um, even in the kidney, that is leading to that intense pain. Many stones will pass with um, just minimal intervention. So an intravenous where we're giving lots of fluid and there's lots of fluid moving through your urinary system. Uh, so we're managing the pain while that process is taking place. But if the stone is larger than four millimeters, and four millimeters isn't that big, right? Maybe the size of a piece of rice. If the stone is larger than that, it's unlikely to be able to make its way through the ureter. The ureter is just far too small to be able to accommodate that. 
And so we really need to look at what other um, interventions would be appropriate. So additionally, you know, in, in, in addition to the work that we're doing around pain management, we really want to understand what the um, cause of the stone formation is so that we can help the patient uh, more likely uh, take part in self-care activities that are likely to decrease um, the further incidence. And so important to gain information about their family history um, around storm formation. Does anybody else in their family have a history of kidney stones? Where do they live? Remember we talked about geography, their diet, uh, an intake of vitamins A and D, their activity pattern related to um, whether they're active or sedentary. Um, if they have um, a history of periods of prolonged illness with immobility or dehydration. Remember we talked dehydration certainly seems to be a trigger. Uh, if they have any other diseases that might be relevant, in particular diseases of the GI or GU tract. Um, and then also looking at um, some of the important dietary things we want to be watching for. Purine is an important one uh, and really limiting that. And so the things that, um, the foods that would be high in purine, I think this is listed in your textbook, but I'll just give you a rundown. Uh, sardines, herring, mussels, liver, kidney, goose, venison, and sweetbreads. Sweetbreads are like um, the meats from the um, reproductive system of animals. A moderate um, uh, level of purine is also found in things like chicken, salmon, crab, uh, bacon. Gosh, that would be hard to give up. Um, we also want to watch calcium, right? Remember we talked about, so purine is one um, uh, nutrient that can lead to the formation of stones, but calcium we know also leads to the formation of stones. And I know you guys off the top of your head could think of the things that um, ha have a lot of calcium. So dairy products like milk or cheese, ice cream, yogurt, things like that. Beans have a lot of calcium except for green beans. We want to watch lentils and uh, fish that have some fine bones like salmon, uh, dried fruits and nuts. Um, and we also want to watch for something called oxalate because oxalates are one category of stone as well. And in that case, we want to be working with our patient around things like um, some green vegetables like spinach, asparagus, cabbage. Um, some other vegetables, interestingly, tomatoes, beets. Um, we want to watch things like coffee and uh, chocolate. And for all of these, it's so funny, Ovaltine, I don't drink your Ovaltine, so I don't know if that'd be a hard thing to give up, but Ovaltine can be a trigger for stone formation as well. So looking at um, surgical intervention and how we manage that is really important. So lithotripsy is um, typically non-surgical, where we're using radio waves for, to break up the stone from a larger stone. Remember we said that if it's greater than four millimeters, we're not uh, likely to be, you're not likely to be able to pass it. Um, and you break up that stone with these, uh, with these uh, radio waves and then your body is able to pass the very small pieces. It still can be a painful process to make sure you've passed all of them and you would continue to strain. Uh, if that is not successful or for some reason the patient is not a candidate for that, you may uh, move to a surgical therapy where it's actually much more invasive and you would do a traditional surgical procedure uh, to make sure that you have uh, removed the stone. And that would be in a situation where the patient is um, experiencing intractable pain, the pain is not, we're not able to relieve it and there does not seem to be an end in sight. So this is not a stone that the patient is able to pass on their own and less conservative measures are not likely to lead to good outcome. Again, it's gonna be important that we do, that we send that uh, product, that stone, for um, pathology so that we understand the constituents of that stone and then move to what we just talked about around nutritional therapy to really decrease the likelihood that that uh, is going to recur. So let's talk for a moment then about tumors. Remember we're talking about all of those things that can lead to obstruction of uh, the urinary tract in some way. Incidence of kidney cancer in Canada, unfortunately one of the cancers that's rising. So in 2012, uh, data tells us that it was estimated that 5,600 new cases would be diagnosed that year, and that of that, 1,700 people would die from it, which is really a tragic um, uh, statistic. And kidney cancers can arise anywhere from the cortex or the pelvis and beyond. So tumors arising from both the um, cortex or the pelvis uh, can be both malign, uh, benign or malignant. So you can have both benign tumors in your kidney or you can have 
malignant tumors. But it's important to recognize that it is much more common when we're talking about urinary tract tumors that they are malignant tumors. Renal cell carcinoma is an adenocarcinoma, and that's the most common type. Uh, adenocarcinoma occurs about twice as often in men as in women, and it's typically discovered in people between the ages of 50 and 70, so older in life. This is an interesting fact and an important one to keep in mind, that cigarette smoking is the most significant risk factor for the development of renal cell carcinoma. Other risk factors are things like obesity and the use of some uh, phenocetin-containing analgesics, exposure to asbestos, and luckily for most of us, that exposure has been minimized with uh, federal and uh, federal, provincial, and local regulations over the last 50 years even, uh, but uh, uh, exposure to cadmium, which is a mineral, and gasoline uh, as well. Interestingly and sadly, there are no um, characteristic early symptoms of renal cancer. So you can have general symptoms, and often we see that with some other uh, kinds of um, intra-abdominal tumors, where you, there, you may see weight loss, weakness, some anemia, um, and then classic later manifestations are things like that gross hematuria. And I don't know if any of you have seen that uh, billboard that, has, that shows a lemon that is dripping uh, red drops instead of um, like, le like yellow from lemon juice. And that caption is, your urine shouldn't be red either. So it's sort of showing that like lemon juice being red coming from the lemon uh, to, to show that sign. And that's a real indicator that people, when they see that, should go, when they see blood in their urine, should go and seek um, intervention or seek uh, uh, identification from their physician as to what's going on. Um, so gross hematuria is a real classic manifestation, but not an early sign. Flank pain, so again, that kidney pain. Um, and often by that point, you can see, you can feel that pal palpable mass. Um, and it, that's a good indicator of that advanced disease. Kidney cancer very um, often metastasizes, and it most often metastasizes to the lungs, the livers, the lungs, the liver, and the long bones. So lungs, liver, and long bones. The um, initiation of that tumor in the uh, cortex or the renal pelvis often extends to the renal vein and the vena cava. And we see that process then of that tumor extending uh, and metastasizing. Um, there's a variety of, of uh, diagnostic studies that would be important in diagnosing kidney cancer. Again, that intravenous pilogram, you notice we talked about that with a couple of other um, pathologies already uh, yesterday and today. Um, and it's a test that really helps us to understand uh, urinary um, flow through the system, where there are blockages and where there are diversions of urine and that, that there may be a space occupying lesion there. Ultrasound is really important. Um, and in the last number of years, probably in the last uh, decade or two, Ultrasound has improved significantly and enabled us to really um, gather a good differentiation between whether a person has a tumor or a person just has a cyst. Uh, we can do angiography, you know, that's where we uh, inject dye into the um, blood flow and really, um, uh, again, get a good look at the blood flow through the kidney and see where that blood flow is being diverted by the space occupying lesion. We can do a percutaneous needle aspiration where we actually put a needle in through the skin to uh, withdraw some fluid to see again if it's a cyst versus a tumor. A CT scan, in the old days, CT scan would take weeks or months to book. A CT scan now is an everyday procedure and we have patients getting that all through the night. MRIs are also important as well. Um, because we do so many more CT scans and MRIs, we are now able to find uh, renal tumors at a much earlier stage than we used to be able to, much smaller than we used to be able to, and that's really important. Um, when we're looking at um, history and physical exam, it's really important that we understand uh, the course of the disease uh, from patient symptomology. Important that we, uh, again, go, um, collect urine for urinalysis, that um, we look at ultrasound or CT results, MRI results, um, cytology studies, so looking at um, what that tumor uh, findings showed when we sent that to the lab. Uh, 
And then we'll look at the possible treatments. Uh, so in terms of collaborative therapy, we may be um, moving to surgical treatment. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, uh, whether it is a transurethral resection, um, a radical cystectomy, uh, use of radiation, um, and uh, potentially uh, medications like alpha interferon or other kinds of uh, intravesical chemotherapy. Okay, so even though we're talking typically here about obstructions and there can be many causes of uh, urinary incontinence and retention, it fits here because it, this uh, certainly obstructions are one cause of those uh, amongst others. So we're gonna talk about this just for a moment. Um, really critical that we focus on our, the basic um, evaluation for urinary incontinence and urinary retention, and that we uh, collect a focused history, that we do a full physical exam, and we do what's called a bladder log or avoiding record whenever possible. And that really gives us a good understanding, not just sort of a patient's uh, recollection of how often they're avoiding and how much, but we actually ask them to uh, indicate how often and the, um, the quantity of urine that they're passing. Um, we really want to understand uh, the onset of the uh, urinary incontinence, the factors that may be associated with urinary leakage and associated conditions, and pay special attention uh, to factors known to produce transient urinary incontinence. So uh, particularly when we're looking at a relatively sudden onset of urinary loss, that's really important that um, if someone is developing incontinence that would be uh, related to aging and change in body function over time, that's a slower process, not a sudden process that impacts our ability to uh, maintain our urine, uh, urinary continence. Uh, physical exam is important. We look at an assessment of both your general health status, uh, functional issues, so example, your urinary function, uh, your mobility, your dexterity, even your cognitive function is gonna be really important. Pelvic exam is really important, and we wanna look at the perineal skin for signs of erosion or rashes that might be related to that urinary incontinence. Um, we also wanna look at local innervation and pelvic muscle strength. And you'll notice now that with a lot of women, I'm not sure how much you might've talked about this in your maternal child course, who after uh, childbirth now go for pelvic floor physiotherapy, which is the kind of physiotherapy that de deals specifically with your pelvic floor. Uh, and for many women, it's kind of a new um, phenomenon here in Canada. Although in France, every woman who has a child vaginally goes for five sessions of pelvic floor uh, physiotherapy, and they do not have the degree of ongoing uh, urinary incontinence that we see in North America. So it's interesting that we're uncomfortable having a physiotherapist potentially um, working with the uh, with our pelvic floor, and they do that by inserting their fingers into our vagina and teaching us to do those kinds of exercises to strengthen that. And yet, on the other hand, the result of not being comfortable with that is that we may spend the rest of our lives struggling with incontinence. It's kind of a silly thing. So for us as nurses, it's really important to destigmatize some of these uh, practices that can make a huge difference in people's lives. Um, let's see, uh, bladder log. Remember we talked about that a second ago. I just want to repeat that. It's really important avoiding diarrhea or bladder log uh, because that tells us a lot about those, um, the incidents and what are the triggers. And we're going to try to keep that for, uh, up to seven days, at least one full day, but up to seven days is really helpful. And the nurse, in an inpatient situation, the nurse can help the patient to do that. Uh, we do a urinalysis. We're looking to make sure that there's not an undiagnosed infection or diabetes. When we suddenly have an increase in, in uh, formation of urine and potentially urinary incontinence, diabetes is always something that we want to rule out because we're going to have an increase in urine uh, formation. We also want to do something called a post-void residual urine, and that tells us about how much urine is left in the bladder after uh, voiding. Has, that, uh, has the patient, when they voided, completely emptied their bladder? Um, so what we do is we ask the patient to urinate, and then we actually do a catheterization relatively close to that point, so five to 10 minutes max uh, from the time. Alternatively, you can do a bladder scan to estimate the residual uh, volume. And now more and more we, we move away from catheterizations, and as long as you've got good technique and reliable results, uh, you may be using a bladder scan instead. 
just to keep in mind, uh, the bladder scan is an estimation. And depending on how critical this result is, you may still find that the uh, physician is asking for uh, an in and out catheter to get an actual result as opposed to the estimation you get from that bladder scan. Um, let's see. When we're thinking about how we um, work with patients, we wanna make sure that we promote adequate fluid intake and that um, we reduce or eliminate bladder irritants, things like caffeine and alcohol that really cause our bladder to be much more irritated, much more likely to spasm, and much more likely to lead to incontinence. Uh, we want our patients to maintain a regular, flexible schedule of urination. So every couple of hours, two to three hours when you're awake uh, to get up and go to the bathroom. I think many of us wait far too long to go to the bathroom until we're like limping down the hall uh, to find our way to a restroom. Um, and it's just, part, I think, part of modern life that we are multitasking in a million ways. But for our patients, we're asking that they go frequently and regularly. Uh, and really, do you remember we talked about smoking? Uh, the interesting relationship between smoking and our uh, renal system, patients who are struggling with urinary incontinence, we ask them to uh, stop smoking because smoking is associated with stress incontinence. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and so it's important that they also recognize uh, in addition to stopping smoking, that keeping their bowels regular, so avoiding constipation, um, is really important both for helping with urinary incontinence, but also uh, preventing urinary retention. So we really wanna be aggressive around managing constipation, making sure they have enough fluid intake, making sure they have enough fiber, making sure that they remain active, and using stool softeners as needed. Um, Let's look here. It's important to recognize that acute urinary retention requires immediate uh, intervention. So acute urinary retention is when someone has a full bladder and is unable to empty that bladder. In the, there can be lots of causes. Again, it can be caused by an obstruction. So you can have something uh, that is preventing you from emptying your bladder. So that uh, benign uh, prostatic hypertrophy, BPH, where your prostate gland is so swollen in men that they're not able to pass their urine. Sometimes they can have, go for long periods of time having difficulty urinating, or they can move to a point where they cannot pass their urine at all. Uh, really critical that we are able to insert a Foley catheter with sterile technique uh, so that we are able to drain that urine from their bladder. It is a critical uh, emergency that we need to be able to do that. Um, you can have urinary retention associated with neurogenic uh, issues. Remember, we talked about that before. A uh, patient who may have a spinal cord injury other, or other situations, you can have um, urinary retention that's associated with a prolapse, other kinds of things with a tumor. We want to, uh, unless otherwise directed, make sure that we insert a Foley catheter and we drain that urine, and then there's a determination of whether that catheter needs to be indwelling or a straight in and out. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, it's important uh, to understand when and why we're catheterizing, and this all falls under instrumentation. So indwelling catheters for a variety of different conditions. I'm not gonna read this all out to you, but it's important that um, we really recognize that less and less are we um, moving towards the use of indwelling catheters. We wanna use them as is necessary and in the patient's best interest. So for example, um, uh, healing after surgeries, when we have trauma to the area, for patients who may have a terminal illness or severe impairment where we are not able to turn and position them appropriately. Um, when we have a stage three or four pressure ulcer for, and we wanna avoid that urine contamination. So these are all thoughtful reasons. Just basic incontinence and that I don't wanna keep changing a patient who's incontinent is not a good enough reason for an, a urinary catheterization. Uh, for, in, uh, for when we're thinking of an in and out catheter or a straight catheter, that's usually used for collection of a sterile specimen. If we want to um, uh, get an in, um, insight into the anatomical structures of the urinary system, if we want to put medications into the bladder, remember I talked about uh, under infection, um, uh, interstitial cystitis, where we have that infection that actually dwells uh, in the interstitium of the bladder, so between the cells. Um, and they actually can instill a variety of medications, including antibiotics, right into the bladder. Rather than having people take them PO or IV, they actually instill that right into the bladder. They can do that for other kinds of conditions as well. And so here you see 
just some diagrams that give us some uh, um, insight into what we're looking at. Uh, when we're looking at nephrostomy tubes, um, that can be inserted, you see up in the left corner here, you've got that tube inserted on a temporary basis, and we do that to preserve renal function when we have a complete obstruction of the ureter, so that we're not able, so we would insert a catheter into the bladder if the obstruction is below the bladder, right? So the bladder is full, and we insert a Foley catheter to drain what's in the bladder. But if the obstruction, let's say we've got a calculi, that's within the ureter, high up towards the kidney, or uh, we've got a tumor pressing on the ureter and we can't empty the urine, that the um, kidney continues to make urine, but that urine is stuck up there in the kidney. That's gonna be incredibly problematic. We wanna um, retain as much uh, kidney function as we possibly can, so we're actually going to insert, an, not us, uh, the physician will insert a nephrostomy tube. And um, that is inserted directly into the pelvis of the kidney, and it's attached to a connecting tube, to close drainage. And the principle is the same as when you're putting in a urinary uh, urethral catheter. Uh, so we want the catheter, see the catheter up here on the left upper diagram, not to be kinked, um, not to be uh, laid on or leaned on or clamped. If the patient is complaining of excessive pain or there's excessive drainage around the tube, we want to check to make sure that it's patent. Now, if irrigation is ordered, this is really important because sometimes irrigation of that catheter uh, nephrostomy tube is ordered. Uh, we want to make sure that we follow strict aseptic technique. No more than five mils of sterile saline solution is gently instilled uh, at one time to prevent over distension of the kidney. Remember, the bladder can take more fluid because it's a, it's a sac, but your kidney does not have that level of give. So no more than five mils of sterile saline solution uh, to make sure that we don't over distend that uh, kidney pelvis and cause renal damage. Um, Infection and secondary stone formation are complications associated with the insertion of that nephrostomy tube. So we want to really um, pay attention to that. It's also important um, that we watch uh, for, again, kinking, um, and that we watch for that spasms that may be associated with it. You also see in these pictures what you've seen before. Uh, so we've got a straight catheter, we've got a Foley catheter, uh, we have a patient over on the left bottom who has a urostomy tube, and we have uh, a variety of introducers that help with um, uh, making sure that we can increase the, um, uh, or that we can insert a stent and make sure that we can have flow through the kidney. Okay, now I gave you a, a couple of clues that we were gonna be talking about BPH as we talked about um, obstruction in general. But um, benign prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy, BPH, it's a, just a basic enlargement of that prostate gland. And it, was, uh, it, it generally results from an increase in the number of epithelial cells and the amount of uh, stromal tissue. Most common urological condition of adult males. You will see this in your career and it would not surprise me if you saw this on the NCLEX. Um, BPH occurs in about 50% of men over age 50 and in about 80% of men over age 80. So it is a very common disorder. Uh, approximately 25% of men require some form of treatment by the time they reach, reach age 80. So again, when we're thinking about Canadian males, a very important uh, indicator of health and something that we need to know about. Uh, it uh, does not predispose a person to the development of prostate cancer, and that's really important. Men who are uh, diagnosed with BPH often think that this is a, a precursor to uh, prostate cancer. It's not. It just is, and that's why it's always called benign prostatic hypertrophy or benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, and typically, it is uh, diagnosed with a history and physical exam. The prostate can be palpated by a digital rectal exam, and it's the physician who's doing that, or the nurse practitioner, the primary care, care, care provider. Uh, in, in doing that, you can estimate the size, the symmetry, and the consistency of the prostate gland. Um, and typically in BPH, the prostate is symmetrically enlarged, right? So it's not, it's not lumpy, it's not enlarged in, in uh, uh, anomalous ways, but it's symmetrically enlarged. You, when you palpate it, it's firm it, to palpation and it's smooth. We may do some additional diagnostic tests. Again, your analysis, and this time with a culture as well. We're going to watch for, the, for um, the presence of infection, look for bacteria, white blood cells, or microscopic blood in that uh, urine. Uh, 
Uh, and so we're going to look at uh, a blood test called a PSA or prostate specific antigen. It's usually measured to rule out um, prostate cancer. But it's important to recognize <coughs> that the presence of an elevated PSA level is not indicative uh, alone of prostate cancer because sometimes in BPH we may see that level elevated. Uh, when we're looking at health teaching associated with uh, BPH, it's important that we um, talk to patients about, uh, again, the need to uh, urinate frequently, uh, the need to make sure that they, when they uh, void, they are completely voiding and emptying their bladder, uh, that they are paying attention to um, uh, periods where there, it appears that they are um, uh, retaining urine. Uh, TERP or transurethral resection of the prostate is a surgical procedure and this is uh, one of the most common uh, approaches by which we manage that BPH. Uh, we'll, uh, in this procedure, it involves the removal of prostate tissue and what we do is we use a resectoscope that we insert right down here at the bottom through the urethra up uh, to where we see that enlargement. Um, and although it is by far the most common operation performed. Um, there's been a decrease in the number of TERP procedures done in recent years, and that's in part um, owing to the fact that we have developed some new technologies that are helpful. Uh, so we can uh, use either a spinal anesthetic or a general anesthetic. There's no external incision. We're going up through that urethra. Uh, that resectoscope is insert inserted to excise and cauterize. That you see here, we have that enlarged prostate uh, and where we have that compressed urethra on the diagram. What we want to do is uh, to cauterize and ex excise and cauterize that obstructing uh, prostatic tissue. And then we leave in a three way uh, indwelling catheter with a 30 mil balloon. That's put in the bladder after the procedure, and that's to provide hemostasis and to facilitate urinary drainage. So we're going to have bleeding from the site. What we want to do is have that um, uh, CBI, continuous bladder irrigation going where we have fluid going into the bladder, flushing through the bladder and coming back out to make sure that we don't have um, blockage of the renal system below the site of that um, cauterization. It's really critical. Um, and I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to look after a patient with a CBI with a three-way Foley catheter and uh, that fluid uh, being um, uh, both where you're, you're administering fluid and then that fluid is drained out and where you're looking after the patients. For the first 24 hours at least following that TERP, uh, the bladder is irrigated usually continuously, sometimes intermittently, uh, and again, to, to prevent both blood uh, clots from, from forming and blocking, but also mucus. We can have a lot of mucus formation. Um, so for about, I'd say 80 to 90%, the data typically tells us uh, patients have excellent outcomes with a really marked improvement of their symptoms following that the TERP. Um, the procedure itself has relatively low risk. But there are post-op complications that it's important to keep in mind, including things like bleeding, that retention of those clots, bladder spasms, which can be incredibly um, uh, debilitating, both in terms of pain, but also with associated symptoms of incontinence. Um, and because of that irrigation, if we're very aggressive with irrigation, we have to watch for hyponatremia that's associated with dilution. Uh, we also have to watch, remember this is a, a disease process that we see with older men, remember about 50% above age 50, 80% of men above age 80 experience it. So uh, those men typically we're going to find that they have other concurrent health problems. We have to watch that for patients who are taking aspirin or warfarin that we need or Coumadin, we need to uh, discontinue that uh, several days before surgery to make sure that we don't have any complications associated with bleeding or we minimize the complications associated with bleeding. So uh, sometimes if a patient is um, experiencing uh, extremely enlarged prostate or cancer of their prostate, the uh, physician is going to elect instead to do um, uh, either a radical prostatectomy uh, through a retropubic uh, procedure or a perineal resection. And so with a retropubic approach, uh, 
they do like a midline incision. You see at that uh, top uh, picture. Um, so you're gonna do that uh, low midline abdominal incision and we're gonna access then the prostate gland through that incision and the pelvic lymph nodes can also be dissected, right? So this is when we're looking at um, um, prostate cancer. With that next one, a perineal resection, an incision is made between the scrotum and the anus. And this procedure is important uh, because while it does give good access to remove the prostate, what it doesn't allow is uh, access to remove the lymph nodes. Um, and more recent approaches to treatment include both laparoscopic and robot-assisted prostatectomies. They tend to have similar surgical outcomes to the traditional approaches, so it's important for us to recognize that, it's, that we are able to move forward with really good outcomes. After surgery, just as with the TERP, our patient's going to have a large indwelling catheter with a 30 mil balloon placed in the bladder via the urethra. So even though the surgery is made through an incision, we're still putting a, a catheter into the bladder with a 30 mil balloon um, uh, through the urethra. And uh, the catheter is typically left in place for one to two weeks. A drain is left in the surgical site and that helps to remove any of the drainage from the area. Uh, and typically that just stays in for a couple of days. So the catheter for one to two weeks, the drain in the surgical incision just for a surgical site just for a couple of days. Because the perineal approach has a higher risk of infection, and you can imagine, right? Look at the surgical site. So it's a high risk uh, site. It has a higher risk of infection. Uh, careful dressing changes and perineal care after each bowel movement are really critical when we're looking at that. Typical uh, hospital stay post-op is about three days. Um, important uh, to recognize two major complications following radical prostatectomy are incontinence and ED. So the incidence of uh, ED, erectile dysfunction, is dependent on a whole bunch of things, including most importantly, patient's age and their preoperative sexual functioning and whether nerve sparing surgery was performed and it would be performed if, if possible. And unfortunately also the expertise of the surgeon. And so that's something to really keep in mind. Uh, problems with urinary control can occur, unfortunately, uh, in nearly all men following uh, the first few months um, post-surgery because the bladder must be reattached to the urethra once the prostate is removed. So that set first several months may not be um, indicative of long-term outcomes associated with um, uh, urinary control, and that can be quite devastating for uh, many patients. So important to keep, them, uh, to keep that in mind and to let them know, and um, recognize that just as we teach uh, post or postpartum mom to do Kegel exercises, we wanna teach um, post-operative men who've had a radical um, prostatectomies, the same thing. Uh, some common complications when we're thinking about prostatectomies, uh, suprapubic prostatectomy uh, or perineal retropubic is that we would watch for hemorrhage, for urinary retention, that's why we've got that catheter in there, but there could be clots, there could be mucus, there could be blood, other things. Uh, we're watching for uh, infection, uh, a DVT and, and pulmonary embolism that we would see in many proce surgical procedures and wound dehiscence. Let's talk for a second about urinary diversion. So in urinary diversion, uh, we, there are a variety of different approaches and you'll see a couple of different pictures here. And I am gonna struggle to say them. Number in A we've got, I'm gonna, let me say this slowly. Ureter oh, il iliosigmoidostomy. That was an ugly one, wasn't it? Sorry about that. In B, we've got an ileal loop or an ileal conduit. That's what you typically will hear it called, an ileal conduit. In C, ureterostomy. Uh, and so uh, we would also see transcutaneous ureterostomy or bilateral cutaneous ureterostomies. And in D, a nephrostomy. And so it's related to the site at which we are diverting that urine. And so we're diverting the urine so that we're able to um, have that urine either um, uh, uh, move past a blockage or where we have removed part of that uh, urinary system to uh, continue to um, pass through our system or to actually um, have that urine um, drain outside of our body. So if you look at that 
um, nephrostomy tube in the final picture, where the urine is actually not draining into the body, uh, down from those kidneys down into, uh, there's no bladder, it's not draining out from the, uh, through the uh, urethra, but rather we've got that nephrostomy tube coming right out of the kidney, out of the body, and a tape to the body so that we're draining it immediately from that side. Um, here's a nice picture. Gosh, what a beautiful stoma. Look at that. Oh, beautiful work. Important to keep in mind that this is really a collaborative effort to have a great stoma. You need uh, a good stoma uh, from a surgical procedure. You need um, a good management um, in terms of a patient taking care of it, and that requires good health teaching. Uh, we want to look and see that it's symmetrical. Do you see how that's beautiful and round? There's no skin breakdown, beautiful red, um, nice mucosal uh, sheen to that. It should protrude about a centimeter and a half. Um, and when the patient is upright and supine, it should be, uh, it should look fairly flat. Lovely stoma. Oh, no. What we see here, do you see that stoma? Oh, it's a heartbreaker. Uh, that ammonia salt, so ammonia is one of the basic components in our urine, that the smell that we get from urine is, is uh, the, that ammonia smell. Ammonia salt crusts around the stoma, and that's associated in particular with alkaline urine. And um, uh, it's really critical that we teach our patients to use appropriate uh, products to protect their skin and to maintain the um, the, that skin health and that we don't have that formation of those salts there. And here we're gonna see, unfortunately, a retracted stoma. Do you remember that first picture where it was about a centimeter and a half out, uh, protruded about a centimeter and a half? Here we have a, re a retracted urinary stoma with a pressure sore. And the pressure sore is from a face plate uh, that was above the stoma. And really it's important that as we're building, the, uh, as we're, um, placing the our apparatus around this we need to use our uh, use products to build up the area around the stoma so that we are draining urine appropriately out into our whatever the collection device is so critical that we do that and that's the end da, 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 of obstructive uropathies and i will be back shortly as we move on with our urology lectures